Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here. You know, don't you? You know. I'm here today to do an epic with my good friend Terry from London. How are you doing, Terry? How are you doing, Porky, man? People forget you are boxing's man of the year. Uh, every year. I know, mate. I know. It's uh, tough at the top, isn't it? <laughs> Let's go balls deep, then. Uh, Billy Joe Saunders against Martin Murray. What do you think, Terry? Terrible waste of time. Waste just just a waste of a of a Saturday night slot. Was it Saturday or Friday? I can't even remember now. Probably Friday, wasn't it? Yeah. And I just go back to what Hearns said in the summer, where he said there'll be no filler. Everyone's coming back in a competitive, challenging fight. And I'm bored of hearing this thing. Like I know Nigel Travis was piping up trying to defend Martin Murray. Martin Murray's a guy that doesn't like boxing for a start, right? Let's be clear about this. He doesn't watch it. He doesn't participate. You don't ever see him at anything to do with boxing. He's just a guy who gets an income from boxing because he's okay at it. So I'm not sold on giving him a payday just for the sake of it. He wasn't who Billy Joe should have been fighting. You know, it, he wasn't good enough to give Billy Joe trouble. Billy just went through the gears, went through the motions. But when you're a professional boxer, you're Billy Joe's level. Don't give me any nonsense about a tune-up fight. And I really like Billy. I like watching him box. But against my, that, my, that version of Martin Murray, terrible. It was just terrible. And it, it was an embarrassing fight on an embarrassing card. Yeah. Do you feel that Billy Joe was either A, practicing his art, or B, was unfit and he couldn't get him out there? I don't think Murray's the guy you can get out there. Like, look, look how long it took a prime Golovkin to get Murray out. It was like 11 rounds, wasn't it? Mm. He's resilient. There's one thing you'll always say about Murray. He's resilient, and you've got to respect that. Uh, I just think, to be honest with you, I think we've already seen the best of Billy Joe. So what we're seeing now is just Billy trying to get his paydays and get out. We've seen the best of them already. Do you feel that when Liam Cameron were offered that fight, to fight Martin Murray on a McKenna show a couple of years ago after he after he's had his last fight. Do you feel that Liam, looking at that performance, will regret not jumping in with Martin? Ah oh, man. They're quite similar. That the problem with that sort of fight is that the two guys were quite similar. They're they're tough men, right? So that's just two tough men going at it. I think sometimes the style can either make or unmake the fight. And Billy Joe versus, for me, Martin Murray was always going to make Billy look good because Billy's more mobile. Liam's not as mobile as Billy. So I think that would have been more of a, you know, Liam trying to get him out of there. And maybe he could have got him out of there, but he'd have had to take some punishment coming back. But now I think that would have been a good fight for Liam. Definitely would have been a good name at that point in his career. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what next for Martin Murray? I just want him to go away. And I don't even say that dis disrespectfully. But what else? What What is he going to do apart from sell his name? And then I look at it and go, but who's he got his name to sell to? And also to an extent, I also, I also don't want to see Martin Murray become that guy where we're just saying, you know, for goodness sake, pack it in. I don't, his style's not to my taste but I've always liked the career he's had because he was a hell of an amateur before he had his trouble with the law. He was a hell of an amateur. And then that kind of derailed him, but he rebuilt and came back. So I always respect that about him, but his time is up. Yeah. All right. Uh, what next for Billy Joe Saunders? Of course, he could, for me, he can only fight people like Canelo, Devrianchenko, Charlo, if he's not fighting one of those kind of top guys that carries a threat, I see that. I don't even want to watch him. You think it's become uh, a little bit tired now of Billy Joe dining at the top table for the last five years, but he's only really got Lemieux on his record, hasn't he? he? He's never dined at the top table. This is the whole point. We've been waiting for him to dine at that top table. Oh, he's been world champion five years, though, Terry. Oh, and we're, we're, where are the wins that you remember? I remember the Lemieux fight in Canada. He scored him, didn't he? But Lemieux wasn't really that good. Former world champion. No, no, no. Lemieux wasn't... Golovkin ran over him, then reversed and ran over him again. Like, like me, Beansy, Rich... Like Beans, he uh, got run over by Richie Apriere in Sopranos. 
Do you know what it is, Russell? What? Billy Joe is the kind of talent that we should be mentioning in, mentioning in the same breath as Canelo and Golovkin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If we're mentioning him in the same breath as Lemieux, he's done something wrong. Yeah. Do you think the glasses are full with Billy Joe and we're never going to get to see the other half a glass? Well, I think part of the, part of the whole thing is, I, I think an element of talent is the desire to want to be the best. And I think Billy's had opportunities to do so and he's found reasons not to do so. And that's disappointing because I really like Billy. And I think, I don't, I don't think Billy needs to get 100% fit to beat a lot of these guys because he's, he's skillful enough. So these things where he says, I need a full 12 week camp, he, I don't think Billy does. You know, he, he, I, and I don't even know why we haven't seen these fights because from what I can gather, they've been really close to happening. But I thought he's almost frozen himself out now. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame, isn't it? Because for five years, we seem to have been hearing about Billy Joe and Canelo, Billy Joe Golovkin, Billy Joe Eubank rematch. And now we seem to be hearing Billy Joe Andrade and these are the fights that I want to be in. Do you know kind of thing? It seems to have dropped down a tier, doesn't it, do you think? Well, okay, so look look at it. In all the time we've been looking for Billy to have a meaningful fight at middleweight, the Charlos have come from nowhere to become top dogs at 160 and 154. Come from nowhere. In all the time we've been looking at Billy Joe. So this has all happened on his watch. Sergey Devryanchenko has become a factor. You know, Danny Jacobs has had a rebirth. All on Billy Joe's watch. And we're looking at Billy going, you are meant to be the sheriff in this weight division. Like, you were waiting for guys like Canelo to come up, mm. and it hasn't happened. You were waiting for guys like Demetrius Andrade to come up, and it hasn't happened. And now you're fighting at 168? Do you feel that Canelo was embarrassed, Billy, by going up from a low weight through, through when he started as a welterweight, didn't he, Canelo? Welterweight, NABA champion, then world title at light middle against uh, Matthew Atten. Middleweight, super middle, light heavy. Do you feel like Canelo's a proper fighting man? I think Canelo's got the thing Billy hasn't got, and it's that that professionalism. Mm. I don't imagine you see Canelo too far out of shape. Like I think he's he's pretty much there or thereabouts. I imagine he's always taking over, working on his craft. I think Billy's always had that gift where he just goes, look, give me six or seven weeks and I can get myself right. Whereas you'd rather Billy just dedicated himself to it. But I don't think he does. And he's got so much going on outside the ring. I don't think he needs to. And I think that's probably what's hurt his career. Mm. All right, then. Uh, what about Billy Joe Saunders, Callum Smith? Who wins if they fight in four or five months? I think Billy Joe wins. I know people talk about Callum being taller and hitting harder and stuff, but you got to be, you can I mean, Billy's got to be there for you to hit him, and he's often not there. And I can see Billy just landing those backhands for fun on Callum Smith. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, Callum Smith's a lot more dedicated, but he probably hasn't got as much in his locker as Billy, do you think? Exactly. He hasn't got those those tools like he hasn't got the, the same golf clubs that Billy Joe has but I don't know who would you say is the fresher out of the two they're both fresh aren't they yeah Billy hasn't got miles on the clock neither has Callum Smith yeah and they're not far apart in age right it's only a couple of years between them mm, it's an intriguing fight one I'd like to see uh I don't know. Well, uh, he's, what do you think about the old super middleweight uh, at the moment? We've got Callum Smith, Billy Joe Saunders. I I don't want to see Billy Joe as super middleweight, for God's sake. I know we because... need middleweight, don't we? But he's not going to take that eight pound off, is he? Because there's no one there at 168. So, okay, so who's Billy Joe going to fight now? Well, I'd like Head to see you, Bank. That's a pay per view, isn't it? John Ryder, bank. maybe a pay per view. Chief Ryder's support. not a pay-per-view. No, no. Russ that could be a chief support on a Joshua show or a Fury Joshua undercard, can it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I thought you were becoming you were becoming too corporate then by saying that was a pay-per-view. No, no, no. Uh, 
Uh, Lerone Richards against Willie Hutchinson. That could be like one under a chief support. That's a good fight, isn't it, to be made? But obviously, he's vacated Lerone Richards now, hasn't he? Oh, I think that was part of the, the deal with Frank. You and I talked about this before where I said yeah. Calder will never let him fight on a Warren show, but he'd have to leave the belt with Frank. Yeah. Well, that's okay. If the movie, if the British and Commonwealth, they can move on to European and fringe world level with their own. You don't need to be rushed, does it? Because we've all seen what happens when fighters are rushed lately, haven't we? But no, wait, wait. But their own's been a pro seven years, Russ. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but some Carl Froch was six year, three months before he got his world title. Six year, sorry, nine months, sorry, before he got his world title. So maybe the own should be looking at a world title. In the next 12 months, then it might be a slow, he might have lost a year, if you know what I mean. Does that sound right? I, I still question if he's European level, even. Do you see what I mean? Like, when, when you're a pro for seven years and we're only now talking about you moving beyond British level, I get worried because I'm like, what have you done for seven years? Yeah, I see what you mean, mate. I see what you mean. It's uh, how long did it take Liam to get his Commonwealth? Oh, Liam Cameron, it took him quite a few years actually. Uh, probably eight years, seven years, seven years, something, something like that. Yeah, so he's had the same challenges, but Liam was younger when he got his right. He's mad setbacks though, didn't he? he turn pro at 18, the ABA champion money. Yeah, he should never have turned pro at 18, should have gone to 2012, would have gone to 2012, would have gone to Olympics, yeah, but yeah. Obviously, sign pro. But uh, all right then. Well, the rest of the Eddie Eddie's card were very very poor. But we'll touch on the Shannon Courtney uh, fight. What did you think to that? Uh, she's quite an exciting fighter, isn't she? Uh, well, that was a fight that was designed for her to look good. Yeah. Right. So, so she fought that Rachel ball. Rachel put her down, and Rachel kind of revealed that. You know, maybe there's a soft underbelly there because Rachel Ball, as we now know, isn't even a hard puncher. So yeah. we we now realise that. And so what they're doing is they're digging up these these obscure names that no one even has a clue about. And, you know, they're going to try and build Shannon Courtney, but there's going to come a point where she has to fight one of those those Mexican bantamweights or Nicky Ragu and bantamweights who, I mean who just stopped transporting drugs across the border to take heads off or whatever. You know, those real hard Latin American women yeah. who are just there to fight. And then what's she going to do? I, I worry. Like, what we don't want to do here is we don't want to create a career that's based on hype. Like, she's almost got that kind of Anna Kornikova factor to her, hasn't she, at the moment, where she's a marketable female boxer, you know, in a world where there aren't that many around. And so they want to get as much out of her as they can. But she's going to face people at some point who, who are, are her kryptonite. And they're generally people who come to fight. And it was the same in the amateurs and it'll be the same in the pros because Shannon Courtney's never been unfit. She's never not been strong enough. She's never not been anything. She's talented. Yeah. But when someone shows up to fight and they're not going anywhere and they're not backing down and they're not going to the ground and they're just not tiring, she starts to doubt herself, then the demons creep in. Yeah. Do you think she uh, beats Rachel Ball in rematch? Uh, I don't think Rachel Ball's that good, so I wouldn't see why not. Like, we're not, t we're not talking about the most talented females at this point. Put her in with the people she was sparring, like Kelly Harrington and Dervla Duffy. When, if, they, if those two ever turn pro, that would be her test. Can you cope with someone like Dervla Duffy? Because from what I was hearing, Dervla came over to Spa and schooled her. Yeah, it's uh, it's in, it, it's interesting times for women's division at the moment, isn't it, Tell? Uh, it could be Russ. It, yeah. it really could be, but they need to stop. They need to just say right. No journey. No journey men. No journey women. Sorry, none of that. Right. All you lot who are now pro. You're going to fight each other. We're just going to have a round robin for a while mm -hmm. until we can get more talented women in and we'll blend them in. Almost like making a cake where you start to fold all the elements in. That's what they need to do. Just stop digging up these Bulgarian shelf stackers to come in as cannon fodder. It doesn't do the sport any good. 
What did you make of Shannon Courtney's uh, going on about mental health when she lost and that? Because if she loses again, what how's that going to play out? Do you think if she gets beat again, what do you think? So I don't think she was making it up, and I don't think she was doing it for publicity. She takes the piece badly; she always has done. And so you, this goes back to what I said before. She. You can't get at Shannon Courtney physically because she comes super prepared, but you can get at her mentally. And the good fighters do, because the good fighters are just as skillful as she is, but it's about who's got the iron will. So I don't think the mental health thing was said for for clicks. It wasn't said, said for clout. I think it'll be a factor again if she loses. If she were to get knocked out, then I don't think you'd see her come back. And quite rightly, you know, she would have done what she set out to do and fair play to her. Yeah, it's uh, all right. Uh, so we spoke about that show. What did you think about the uh, the the punditry on the on the Sky Show, Terry? Come on, be honest. What did you think about it? Yeah, I've stopped. I've stopped caring about it. It's 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 such a such a low standard, and it's it's almost like they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. If you're trying to sell me a storyline, cool. If you're just there to be continuity men, so you get me excited about Shannon Courtney fighting Becky Connolly for the Commonwealth title at some point next year, fine. If you're trying to be serious boxing analyst, do that, but stop trying to do both of them because it's not working at the moment. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to some of the match and stuff in a minute. We'll go straight in with... Uh... not Frank's show, the Spence Garcia before we come to Frank's show. What did you think to the Spence Garcia fight? It went the way I thought it would. Errol Spence just outworked him, denied him the oxygen to do anything. And Danny Danny just said, I'm just going to do the 12 rounds. You could see it. There was a point where Danny was trying to be competitive, but because Danny's very much, he relies on his lead hand a lot. So Danny Garcia is very much a a jab and a left hook sort of guy. He's not a right-handed fighter, really, yeah. in terms of the punches he throws. So once Errol Spence was dominant in that space, and Danny couldn't really work around that, and Spence was so much busier that he didn't give Garcia the oxygen to do anything. Mm. And then you just can't hear Spence just kind of coasted to a, a reasonable win. But it's, it's once again like, you know, Danny Garcia, huh? What do you make of his career so far? I still think he's living off that Amir Khan win, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah. But entertaining fight. Like, goes to show, Russ, what happens when you when you make fights that the fans are happy to see. Yeah. You get quality output. Yeah, I always had Spence as a favourite, but I know, I know Garcia's never been stopped and he's tough. He's from Philly and all that, isn't he? So I were, uh, I were impressed by Errol Spence. What next for Errol Spence, though, Terry? What do you think? Mm. I'll keep it in-house with Spence so I can see a Pacquiao fight happening next year. Yeah. And I think they'll, they'll drag out this Crawford thing for as long as they can. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, moving on from that, what did you think about... Well, basically, the Frank Warren show... Uh, I don't want to talk about every fight on there because there was so, some of it were awful, but we'll start with Dennis McCann. We like Dennis, don't we? Um, I I haven't heard my friend Eddie Lamb talk as highly of a boxer as he does about Dennis. Like he thinks Dennis McCann's special. Yeah. I know they had some good sparring with Thomas Asomba in the build up to this, and as I said to Eddie at the time. There's no better guy right now to be around than Thomas Asomba because he'll cause Dennis problems. And so I think this is really good for his education. And he's, he shows he's doing things the right way. You and I talk about this a lot, Russ, where we say, yeah. I'm always surprised that British boxers love to be the top dog in a gym in their early 20s. Yeah. Like, you know, they never go away. They never want to be the number two guy and learn. And that's why when they get to the kind of TV pay-per-view level, they fold because they've never had to come up under anyone. Yeah. Whereas look at Dillian. See, Dillian did. Dillian was in the Klitschko camp. I know he's in the Hay camp. He's in the Chisora camp. He's been in everyone's camp. Sure, his in camp. His... 
the top. Fury's camp as well. Yeah. He's done a few camps up there with Peter. And that's how you, that's how you learn your trade. Yeah. When, you're, when you're a heavyweight, that's how you learn your trade. You, you just go and do the rounds, whereas you've got these guys now wanting to be the top dog in their own gyms, and you're like, well, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, Ingalls. They do a lot of body sparring up there, don't they? And they don't really do proper full-on contact and that. And do you feel that that's a detriment to the fighter? Because it's come out this week that uh, Anthony Yard done, hasn't been sparring. And Do you think that affects fighters moving forward if they don't spar, Terry, correctly? So, so I think people need to understand what happens in the Ingle gym. In the Ingle gym, it's you either do body or you do head. You don't do both. Yeah, that so that was always a philosophy. So sometimes you go and you do body, and like you tend to, you tend to crank it harder in body. So like you definitely put put the power shots in, and that's where you get your strength from. And then with the head shots, it's more about timing, head movement. Can you counter? And then like when you're coming into competition season, whether it's a fight camp or you're amateur tournaments, you start to bring it all together. And so that's the Ingle philosophy, and that means. You don't sustain the same level of concussion. You know, you're just, you're not putting the miles on the clock when you're young. Now, with the Anthony Yard, <coughs> people talk about he doesn't spar. It's not true. He does. He really does. And I know that because I know the guys he spars. But I don't think they prepared for this Lyndon Arthur fight. That's my worry. It's almost like they believed the best version of Anthony Yard would beat Lyndon Arthur. Now, it's... It's a, I think it's a really complex issue, Porks, and I know we haven't got time because there's a load of things you want to touch on. So I did it. Did, I don't know if you listened to it, but I did the podcast episode on it. Yeah. And I, the one, hmm? I heard it. Yeah, I heard it. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I said, Russ, was I still don't know if he's over losing his dad and his, his grandmother. I think it was his grandmother to COVID. I don't know if he's over that. So it's hard to judge Anthony Yard's performance because I don't know if he's fighting while grieving. Yeah. And if, if he is, then that was a hell of a performance. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the actual fight, Terry? Ah, well, so <laughs> my, my, my theory is this, Russ. I think Joshua Boatsy beats Lyndon Arthur. I think Lyndon Arthur beats Anthony Yard, and I think Anthony Yard beats Joshua Boatsy because ultimately stars make fights. Lyndon was just really smart, and he made Anthony Yard plant his feet, and as soon as those feet were planted, Lyndon would just move off behind his jab, knowing that he was too long, he was too mobile for Anthony Yard to be letting those shots go. And it was, it was hard to watch as Yard would swing and miss wildly with his shots because he's so used to people coming towards him that those punches normally land. And now, had they done some training, had they found someone like a, like a Craig Richards to do that kind of work with, I think they could have solved a lot of these problems. But it just goes to show that there was a, a lack of preparation for this fight. And they took Lyndon Arthur too lightly. And I know you're going to touch on this later on, Russ, but people need to respect who the hell Lyndon Arthur actually is. Yeah, because do. without Joshua Boatsy, Lyndon Arthur is the best of his generation, or arguably the best of his generation. Yeah, uh, Lyndon Arthur right, has gone under radar because they're not hanging out the back of IFL. They're not based in Essex or surrounding areas. And they're the seen as unfashionable northerners. But let me tell you this. Pat Barrett could punch for fun when he fought. And he was a good fighter. Very good fighter. European champion. He knocked one guy in a fight. I remember watching it. He put the guy to sleep. He carried him out on a stretcher. And Did, he was, didn't he do it to everyone? Like, he literally he he went through a rug. He was doing, doing that regular. So And they were fetched up under Brian Hughes at the... Moston and Collierhurst Club, and reel the names off from there, Terry. Jennings, uh, Michael Jennings for sure. Michael I think Crawler, Crawler, Crawler was there, wasn't he? Robin Reed, what first Robin Reed. champion from there? Scott Quigg. Yeah, uh, Scott. Hatton, no, Hatton wasn't from there. Hatton was. Uh, Scott Quigg won a British title Ooh. with Brian Hughes before he moved on. Yeah, and I'm trying to think who else. Would, even if you look at Zalfa Barrett, Lyndon Arthur, then you can throw them in the mix. You can throw Blaze Mendo in the mix there as well. And Pat Barrett would have listened to Brian Hughes. When Pat Barrett went to prison, uh, Brian Hughes went to court and spoke up for him. 
he also sent Pat to America at one point to uh, learn his craft. With back. Lennox's old trainer, wasn't it? Uh, Pepe uh, Carrillo. John, John, no, 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 no. It was John someone. I was going to say, not John. Oh. John Davenport. John Davenport. Yeah, I remember seeing a programme about it on YouTube. It, uh, Sky had done and Pat Barrett had gone out to America and he toughed it out and that. But... Uh, so he, he's, he's, he's steeped in boxing, so that means that Zelfa Barrett and Lyndon Arthur, who, who's related to Pat as well, I think, they'll, yeah. they'll know boxing. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. They, they, look, you know, we always hear about these super trainers, and when things go wrong, they always wheel out the same names, Mark Tibbs and Shane McGuigan and Adam Booth, and everyone always says that, right? They, no one ever said well, Pat Barrett. Hey, listen, but Pat look, Barrett's got to be in mix for trainer at year on it this year now, surely. Not even that. I think he's got to be he's got to be one of those guys you look at. And you've got to now look at his whole portfolio of fighters and go, when have you seen a Pat Barrett fighter with a rubbish jab? When have you seen a Pat Barrett fighter who can't move? When have you seen a Pat Barrett fighter who can't defend themselves? Never is the answer. All of his guys are fundamentally sound. When they come out of that gym, they're fundamentally sound. And I love seeing that in a trainer. Like, you, you know me, like when I watch trainers, I'm just looking for, are all the basics covered? And for him, they are. And like, what you saw with Lyndon Arthur, there you go, well you, prepared. Do you remember, Teddy, when Robin Reed went to Italy and ripped the WBC belt off Nardiello, who were in his corner, Brian Hughes and Pat Barrett? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. look, that's a tight gym. Like, that Collarhurst and Moston, you have to read. There's certain gyms you have to respect, and you respect that one because of the lineage. And one of the things Brian Hughes was big on was everyone has to come back and help the next generation. Yeah. So I think Robin Reed used to go back. I don't know if he still does, but yeah, Robin used to go back. That's regular. He goes down there with kids, with kids all the time, Robin. Yeah. And so Crawler will go back. A lot of guys go back and help out. That's what boxing is for me, you see? And so. I'm glad that Pat Barrett's getting his moment in, in the limelight. And I hope young, ambitious fighters respect this. And they go, that's what I'm looking for in a trainer. Well, yeah, Pat doesn't seem to do a lot of interviews, does he? He doesn't do a lot of interviews. And you don't seem to see him on social media retweeting everything that Eddie Earn puts out. I mean, if Eddie Earn puts a tweet out, first person to retweet it or comment, <laughs> Steffi Bull, isn't it? You don't you don't get a lot of that there from Pat. He's just a old school type of trainer, do you know, kind of thing. Mick Whale, Glim Rhodes type, aren't they? They're, they're not they don't they're not into all that arse licking, are they? Nah, nah, because they know and they know what they can produce. They don't need to con the public. They know what they can produce. What well, which brings me to before we go on about the actual well, we've spoke about the fight, but which brings me to what do you feel about these trainers at the moment that are constantly doing interviews on social media all day and all, all night at home, constantly just doing interviews, giving their opinion on why fighters got beat and this and that, blah, blah, blah. Do you feel they're doing it to put themselves in a shop window and there's an ulterior motive or do you feel that they're doing it for the love of the sport, giving up three and four hours of the Sunday afternoon up? What do you think, Terry? Russ, I know you absolutely hate it. You hate it with all your heart and soul. And it it grinds your gears and makes your blood boil. It probably gives you an ulcer. <laughs> but but I, I also understand where they come from, right? When you're a trainer, you're kind of behind the scenes. So it's very hard for people to know what you're about. It's very hard for people looking for a trainer to know what you're about. And sometimes that visibility can help you attract the right kinds of fighters. I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan of doing too much of it. You know, and, and look, as we find out with, with, with the content we do, Russ, too much of it dilutes your brand. Yeah. But the right, amount, the right amount gets you in the sweet spot of still being behind the scenes, but also the public get to see what you think. Yeah. And like, like for example, I have no issue listening to Dave Caldwell talk boxing. I think he's got some good views on it. But you can only watch it, he's only, you know, after he said it once, I mean, he said it a thousand times. So one interview is enough for me. Um, you know, maybe maybe Johnny Nelson could wind it in a bit, to be honest with you. Like, we should we should be able to mute some of the people. Dave, Dave's allowed to speak. 
Um, Johnny's not allowed to speak for four days after a fight. What do you think to Johnny Nelson's comments regarding James Tennyson beats Tank Davis? I think he's 100% right. I think Tennyson beats Tank Davis. I think Tennyson would beat the best version of Barrera, Morales, Pacquiao, um, <laughs> put David Diaz in the mix, Duran, um, Aguayo. Yeah, yeah he'd beat all of them. Yeah, he'd beat all of them, wouldn't he? And that Tennyson, it's that power, Russ. I mean, it's that power, isn't it? Uh, it's, yeah. come, it's come to my <laughs> attention in the last 24 hours from somebody well in the know, who's well in the know at Sky, that when Johnny Nelson comes out with these comments, he's told to come out with them from the top brass at Sky for the simple reason they want fans to back the wrong fighter on Sky bet. So let's just break that down about some of the predictions that Johnny has given us over the years. Exhibit A, Your Honour, as Ultratech would say. Johnny Nelson said Kel Brook beats Golovkin. Exhibit B, Your Honour. Johnny Nelson said Amir Khan beats Canelo. Exhibit C, Your Honour. Johnny Nelson said that Tackham is like George Foreman and Evander Holyfield rolled into one, and he were worried for Anthony Joshua. Exhibit D, Your Honour. Conor McGregor beats Floyd Mayweather down the straight because it's about fitness. Exhibit E, Your Honour, or is it F? Tennyson beats Tank Davis. Now, is Johnny Nelson just trolling, or is it true what I've heard that Top Brass have said, Johnny, you've got to push this and let's get people back in the non favourite so we can get some money in. What do you think? If if that's true, I think Skybet will be in massive trouble. What I will say, Russ, is having having known the guys at Skybet, because the building they're at in Leeds, I think it's Wellington Square in Leeds. Yeah. What they they we, we used to work in the same building for a bit. Yeah. They don't need Johnny Nelson to to help them make money. They've got some of the smartest human beings when it comes to the statistics on earth. Like if you would go there, Russ, and you'd love it because it's all numbers and dates and they all know their facts and figures. You'd love it. I genuinely think Johnny just does it for a laugh. I do. I think he just says dumb stuff for a laugh. You know, like he's probably sat there bored out of his nut having to watch Eddie Hearn's garbage man now year after year he's had to sit through that nonsense because johnny's a real boxing guy and he just sits through this nonsense and i bet he just sits there and goes i'm just going to tell them tennyson beats tank davis because quite frankly i've got nothing better to do with my evening that's what i think well uh so so sky taking subscription money offers and pay-per-view money and keeping it at a fixed rate this pay-per-view 25 quid for joshua Sky doing all that, if we can have a go at them for that and call them scammers, who's to say that they're not trying to scam us with betting? Betting's too, is this highly regulated, Russ? Like, yeah, all right. yeah. It, it's very, very, it's very, very hard to to act the fool with, with betting because it's, it's so socially sensitive, isn't it? That, yeah, yeah. I, if, if, if that's what they're doing. And I don't know, but if that's what they're doing, is it's, it's despicable. But I'm I'm prepared to believe Johnny. Not just mentioning did. betting though, are they, Terry? They're just saying he thinks that he beats him, and it puts that element of doubt in millions of people's minds. And I mean, say if there's say if a million people are watching Johnny come out with that, what if five percent of them are gamblers, and what if twenty five percent of those five percent all want to put money on Tennyson? And get so I'm asking your question, Russ. Yeah. Would you believe anything Johnny Nelson told you about boxing? Well, you know, I bought my second at last Mercedes with tips that were going against what Johnny said. <laughs> when Johnny <laughs> says so and so wins, you back the other guy, don't you? <laughs> See, there you go. So, so yeah, I, I, I think Johnny's just taking the piss. Yeah. All right then. Uh, Terry O'Connor. He's been slipped on a few shows since his writs and mess. Uh, do you feel that he'll be slipped back into the matchroom fold soon? 
Uh, mate, boxing's like everything else. You have to keep people happy or they'll leave the reservation and they'll start talking. So Terry O'Connor had his hand slapped for not sticking to the script. He's probably said, look, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. And they'll just let him back on. Because what are you going to do, punish him and then have him come on Porky's corner and start telling the truth? No way. No, yeah. So do you think that Terry O'Connor will basically be working on a match some shows about April, May time? Probably sooner than that. Yeah. Which this, what I notice about these sorts, they, they sort of slip into the arena, don't they? they? Sit quietly and then wait until they're needed and they don't they're not mingle they only mingle with their own with their own peers, don't they? They don't get drawn into any of that uh that, that interview will carry on. They don't do interviews, do they? can't, can they? Nah. The board have their self control. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh spoke about it. Mayweather Logan Paul. Yeah, I think it's fantastic news. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's oh. Yeah, I do. Nope, I'm not, Russ. Think about this, Russ, right? Let's say you build Porky's Corner up and it gets to 3 million subscribers and you're doing a million views per video. Let's say you're doing that, right? Yeah. Why should anyone stop you making money? I don't care how many young guys come through. I don't care how many new channels come through. No one should ever stop you making money as long as you're making that I mean, as long as you're doing your numbers, Mayweather's the biggest brand in boxing right now. We can all agree on that. There's no question about that. So if he can still make 60, 70 million in exhibition bouts, why shouldn't he? Well, yeah, there's that in there. But uh, do you think that it's taking the shine off all these young kids coming through and it's, it's dates that they could be having or investment that could be going into the to watch them fight? He gave them a chance. Floyd gave everyone a chance to step up and no one stepped up. So Floyd's like, then I'm going to keep making this money. Because if you remember, when Mayweather retired, he hoped that one of Spence, Crawford or Broner would step up and become that guy that could help him generate 150 million. That's what he wanted. They needed to come back to fight one of them. And they've all managed to kind of screw it up somehow. So Floyd's just gone, well, if I can't make money off them, I'll fight McGregor. Then I'll fight this Japanese kid. Now I'm going to fight Logan Paul because Logan Paul brings legit eyes to the table. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Which brings me to the confirmed news that Ricky Atten's looking at doing an exhibition. Uh, what do you think to that? And is, is this going to take off in England? Because we've now got with John Fury. The hardest man in the world. He's calling out Iron Mike Tyson for his exhibition bout. Do you feel that this is how it's heading now? It's more about people being characters on social media and getting this projecting themselves into these fights to make money. Do you think that's taking the shine off what boxing actually is? Queensby rules and bringing people up from area level up to world title. What do you think? Bah. No one cares about all that nonsense, Russ. No, I, who cares? I do. Cares? Oh. You see, you, you're you're a dinosaur in this game now, man. No one cares about belts anymore. Uh, the belts are irrelevant now. Like I'm all about make the fights that I want to see. So, what people need to do is they need to really understand why that type of fight was so big. I reckon sixty or seventy percent of the people who bought that pay per view have no idea who Roy Jones Jr. is. Yeah. I don't- <laughs> Yeah, I think most people had no idea. They just remember Mike from The Hangover, his podcast, Loving Weed, and his YouTube clips. That's what people, most people who bought that pay-per-view don't really know either of those two fighters, but they know Mike, the personality. They don't know who Roy Jones is, and they don't realize for a time Roy Jones was one of the best boxers to ever do this. Ricky Hatton is not that. Ricky Hatton isn't he's not a living legend in the sport and i don't care how many beer drinking burnley supporting people watch this video and tell me ricky hatton is this i went to vegas for ricky hatton ricky hatton is a fringe world level guy right mike tyson is a cultural phenomenon 
Yeah. That's why he did the numbers. Ricky Hatton's not doing pay-per-view numbers. I don't care what anyone says. He's not doing pay-per-view numbers. Because, Jesus, that Nigel Benn wasn't doing pay-per-view numbers. Do you see what I mean? And Nigel Benn is a bona fide British icon. Yeah. So what do these people think they're going to do? I don't, I don't want to watch Ricky. I don't care, man. He fought that Sinchenko guy, and that was tough enough to watch. Yeah. And then you've got Big John Fury, but he's just inserting himself everywhere. So fair play to him. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not going to take shots because, to be honest, he was calling out Mike Tyson well before all of this even I mean, started off. He was like, I'll fight any man. Yeah, yeah he's not had a fight yet. I don't even know who you put him in with. I'd put him in with you, to be honest. I know, yeah. Yeah. Put, put, put the pork in the fury. Yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? That, yeah. I mean, You've got that one holding my eyes up. <laughs> you know, I don't even know how. How would you cope with your head movement, though? He'd just grab his hands around my neck and put his thumbs in his eye, my eyeballs, wouldn't he? <laughs> 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 I'd be walking around like Stevie Wonder. All right, yeah. then. Man- mandatory is Terry. Yeah. These mandatories with rematch clauses, is it ruining the sport? What's the whole point of getting to the stage of getting a mandatory so you can beat the champion and, and there being a new guy on the scene? Well, no, no. So, so let, let's be clear about what we're talking about here. Okay. So when there's a mandatory, there's a defined split. I think for the IBF, it's like 75-25. So, or is it 80-20? It's one of the two. So that's what Pulev gets. Now, think about it. There's no, there's no crowd. It's not a great pay-per-view spectacle. We kind of expect Joshua to blitz him in three or four rounds. So Pulev's there going, my money's not going to be great. So Hearn goes, we'll put another three million on if you sign the rematch clause. And so Pulev's like, I can make this money twice. Yeah, okay. I'll take that. That's why they do it, to be honest. Now, I'm not in favor of it because I think once you lose the belt, you should have to build your way back up, unless it's a controversial loss. So, when Joshua lost to Ruiz, he shouldn't have had an immediate rematch. But I know that's a voluntary thing, so people say that. But for my, my belief in this thing called boxing is. You have your chance. If you screw it up, let the next guy have a chance and then you kind of build your case to have a chance again. Old school. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Uh, Let's have a look. Callum Johnson, Liam Smith, Natasha Jonas, Josh Warrington, Joshua Boatze. What's happening with them? Uh, Too expensive. Smith's got Canelo, don't we, but... Been inactive, aren't you? John Ryder throwing mint mix as well. They're too expensive, Russ. Mm. Did we talk about this before? Where I said, if you look at where we're at in boxing, yeah, Joshua pays for himself, Dillian pays for himself, Chisora pays for himself, right? Those guys pay for themselves. And we talked about it in relation to Kel Brook. I now I remember is that because of the profiles exactly? So, Kel Brook, you got to pay him six figures to box, right? But he doesn't generate that in the current climate. So why would you put him on? You gotta pay Callum Johnson six figures now to fight. So why, you know, you're not gonna be able to justify that with the budgets you've got. So so you end up in a position where guys like Joshua want to get their stable on their pay-per-view shows. The same with Dillian. Um, Derek will just get guys who are friendly to him and David on there. So there, no, there aren't even any pay-per-view slots to put a Callum Johnson on because it's like, well, why am I paying for these guys? They're nothing to do with me. So now they become very expensive to put on a Saturday night unless you can get them a B-side fight in America. That's why Callum Johnson fought Baturbiev. That's the only way you can give him the money he thinks he deserves is by being a B-side to one of these American guys. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. Sam Eggington. And Dave Allen, Sam Eggington's last fight with Matcham, age 24. He's now with NSC. Dave Allen's last fight, age 27. He's retired. Uh, what do you make about what do you make about them two at the moment, Eggington and Dave Allen? Well, hopefully Dave stays retired. Dave's a nice guy. 
Um, I have nothing bad to say about Dave. But if he's retired, he's retired. Like this, this retiring and unretiring thing, I don't respect because it cheapens, it cheapens the sport. But what can you do? He In terms of back, it, so what, what, what would you think then? Ah, uh, let him fight John Fury. <laughs> But no, in terms of Eggington, never been a fan. Um, he always struck me as being a, a Barry Hearn project that never quite worked out. And so once Barry got bored, he just got rid of him. You think that's what happened? It feels that way. Seemed a shame because he were a favourite at one point, wasn't he? And Dave yeah, I, don't even, favorite, I don't understand why. Like, try and stop Dave Allen from retiring, did he? Nah, Dave, they, uh, Eddie he, and Barry got bored of Eggington and Dave Allen and that kind of thing and Ed Robinson and Bean and them. You think it were all a bit, I don't know. Eggington seemed to just be getting flogged all the time or, or flogging people, didn't he? I suppose he were in good fights, but do you think the comedy aspect of it then? No, 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 no. So I think with Dave, Dave, Dave was too expensive, right? It's, it's, think about trying to get Dave Allen to fight. Dave, Dave's charge. He's asking for what two hundred grand or five. Yeah. How are you going to get that without pay per view? Well, you're not going to do, are you? Yeah. So why why does Eddie need him now? Eddie doesn't need him unless he's a B side to someone. But we know Dave's not an amazing fighter, so we can't even put him on a B side for a pay per view. So actually, Dave loses his value. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about it all. I, I'm not happy about the fact that. They were overmatching him and they were getting good items because that left a bad taste in my mouth. That some, some, he had some proper items, man. Louis Ortiz flogged him, Yoka flogged him as well. David Price, there's three good items there, man. He didn't so much get flogged off Dylan White, but he went the distance with him, so they'd have been damaged there, wouldn't they? Yeah, and at a time, Russ, when, when head injuries are front and center in the sporting discussion. We can't overlook the impact this may have on Dave five, ten years down the line. Yeah. And of course, when he gets to 50 in 22 years, or whatever it is, 21, is he 29 in March? So in another 20 year, when he's 49, 50, and it's all over, is Eddie Earn going to be going around and giving him a few quid? Cheeky, yeah, Dave, get yourself a cheeky Nando's. You'll be caked in a few weeks. Is he going to be going around there chatting that Essex slang in Cunningsborough? Or will Eddie be long gone? As well, okay, so let's turn it around, Russ, and go. It's on Dave Allen to work out how Dave Allen keeps making money into old age. Yeah. You know, he's got the profile, he's got the following, so it's up to him to leverage that. If he just sits on his hands and waits for life to happen for him, then he'll get what he deserves. But he's yeah. he, he's been in the public eye. So why isn't he getting endorsement deals? You know, why isn't he why hasn't he got an underwear deal or something? Anything then? That's what he should be thinking about now. It's just he's doing something with JD Sports, I think, modeling, which is good for him, isn't it? Because he's not gonna be getting punched in the head, is he? Because he's like he is likable, but I don't want to see him used yeah. by the Essex fuckers, mate. Yeah, there we go. Um, that this is this is the porky we needed, man. I think yeah, you, you've yeah, been yeah. too civilized for too long. I've been trying to be civil, trying to be a bit corporate today, so I get towed off. But no, I don't want to see him coming back in July when he's built a bigger profile, and uh, and them lot feeding him to somebody, you know, like Babic or somebody like that. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to see that him going ten rounds with Babic for. Well, it won't happen if Dave stays retired, right? No, it won't. If he stays retired, no. But if if the if the media work dries up and he gets that itch to train again, uh, they'll they'll not hesitate. They mind all that Adam Smith. Yeah, he should stay retired. Well, what about if he comes back? What they're going to say then? Well, he's still got something left to prove, and he's training with Freddie Patopoulos Monopolis now. He's eleventh trainer, or whoever he's going to train with next, because he's had that many trainers. Twelve trainers, hasn't he? So if, so if he's training with Fred Blow next and Fred Blow's this super-duper trainer that can drag some out of him that the other 12 couldn't, are we going to hear all that? I mean, what, ex, what script could they write next if he come back? Because, trust me, there's one being cooked up, but they don't know what to put in the ingredients. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what? You like that ingredients one, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> 
Did that tickle you, that? Um, um, we spoke about exhibitions. We spoke about uh, the, man, the mandatory situations. Oh, and we did speak about that, but if you remember Vladimir against Fury, that had a, a rematch clause, didn't it? And do you remember the Joe Calzaghe Carl Frotch deal, which I saw? Frank Warren wanted options, but that were a mandatory. So, who's running these governing bodies? Is it the promoters, or is it, are the governing bodies in charge? No. Nah, so, look, the governing bodies will have their rules, Russ, and then the promoters will agree certain things between themselves. Yeah, that's what happens. Now, the rematch clause. People forget this. The rematch clause isn't necessarily ratified by the IBF, although in this case, it's Joshua, so they probably have ratified it. But you, you, you've seen it before where these rematches happen and then someone's like, you've got to drop one of the belts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, see, I see where you're coming from. It's just that uh, I want people to get to manager positions, beat the champion, then be able to but go their own way. And that champion, because he's lost, he's got to go to back at Q and come again. I don't want to see any of these. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. So my challenge back to that is we need to get away from this in boxing because what happens is that defeat becomes so serious for your career that you become risk averse. I'd rather actually that let's say, let's say Fury beats Wilder. Wilder shouldn't go back down to number 15 in the rankings. Wilder should kind of go down somewhere sensible, maybe three or four. Yeah, I'm if still stay, staying in the mix, but I don't want to see him in the rematch straight away. I want to see that other guy uh, fight someone else, and I want to see the former champion have like an eliminator or then a final eliminator to get back in the mix, you know, earn it. And I'm not saying discard them, still keep them in the top 15 so they could always be a, a juicy voluntary. I listen, I, I saw a guy fight for a world title, screw it up. Get, have a word with the IBF and he ends up back high up in the rankings again where he could have a final eliminator which he then lost abroad so you know what I mean I've seen that happen Russ I know you've seen it happen too yeah. where, where 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 you never quite go to the back of the queue if you know the right people yeah yeah it's what happens isn't it I just think it's wrong alright then last few couple of things now then uh, Ashley Theopane what did you oh, think? Oh, God. What did God. You... How old is Ashley Fearpain now? 40. We like Ashley, don't we? But. Uh, uh, hold on. Hold on. He's, he's, he's taken a couple of shots at me before, so I can't say I'm in, I'm in the pro Fearpain camp, if I'm being honest oh. with you. He's had a go at Big Mick. Which Mick? Mick Whale. No, Mick, Mick Webb. Mick Webb from Balby. <laughs> Don't he? No, no, not Mick Webb. Mick, uh, Mick Hennessy. He's had a go at him yesterday because he's had to sort his own travel out to Mick's show to fight the, the guy he's fighting. Who's fighting? Eggington? Yeah, yeah. He's having to sort his own travel out. He, he saw, somebody sent me a screenshot on Twitter and it was a big talking point amongst hardcores. So. <laughs> the hardcores, oh, <laughs> the ones by the tickets. <laughs> no. So, what do you think? Um, you like a diva. So, Ashley Theophane is. He's like a. You know, like you could get in the old days, you could get like a Ford Granada. Like a Ford like Granada. Like a, like a D-Rage. Back in the day, get D-Rage Ford Granada. Scorpio. Right? Scorpio. No, nah, no, nah, no. Just the standard Ford Granada. You know, the one with the kind of a bit more round than the original shape. Two liters now, <laughs> Yeah, so so now the Granada's not a great car. It's okay. Like, it was nice because I had a thermometer in the, in, the, in the car, which was quite cool. And like, Theophane's kind of like a Granada, but maybe you could get the Granada gear, which had a little bit of trim. What about what the Gear is. X, Terry? We're all fully loaded. Well, he's not fully loaded. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> right? So for me, Theophane's a guy who, he's really like a, in America, they just call him club fighters, don't they? That's what Theophane is. He's a club fighter. I like him, who, actually. Go on. Nah, he, he got a bit of shine because 
he was affiliated with Mayweather. He was a good sparring partner. That's why he got a a, a bump from Mayweather because he was just a really good sparring partner because he's tough and Theophan is tough. But he's he's not a guy to be demanding any kind of travel. He's a journeyman as far as I'm concerned. And journeymen organize their own travel. I'm sure he can claim expenses back. Yeah. Let me, Hennessy will give him a, a little one for that train ticket. But look, like I know Ash. Ash, Ash is... Ashley went to school with Ashley. Weirdly enough, I think Ashley went to school with Bradley Wiggins. I think they were all in the same year. Yeah. But he went to school with a friend of mine, um, fellow coach at the lodge. That's how I know Ashley. So he came down when Badu Jack came, you know, and he, he, you know, we spoke. He, we, we, we now have an understanding. But as far as I'm concerned, he's just, he's just trying to get a bit of money because he's trying to set up his own little Ashley Theophane Foundation and stuff, which is noble and it's good. But I don't think he did well out of boxing. And he's, it's dawning on him that, I mean, sooner or later, he's going to have to find a job. Yeah. Yeah, he's probably hitting home, home against him now, isn't it? Yeah, because you see, Russ, what we don't talk about is how all of these guys who, they're all coming to the ends of their careers or maybe their careers are finished and they're trying to find something to do. And so they get annoyed at Porky Russ because Porky Russ has got a channel that's got a profile, which is greater than theirs. And they get annoyed at guys like me because I've got a podcast that does more numbers than theirs does. And they go, who are these guys and what right do they have to be making money in boxing when I don't? So we become the victims of their envy. Oh. And there's nothing more annoying than listening to bitter, failed boxers have a go at people who, who aren't failing. Do you know what I mean? Like... Just because you're a good boxer, it doesn't give you a right to have a podcast. It doesn't give you a right to have a YouTube channel. Like We've all had to work at this, spend our own money and get it wrong numerous times before we got it right. Yeah. And I think these guys in boxing need to understand that once you stop getting hit in the face, you go right to the back of the queue and you've got to earn your right in whatever it is you choose to do after that. Yeah, I suppose. And do you think that Ashley's probably reminiscing about 10 years ago when it were Mayweather and they're probably going to arenas in a limo and stuff like that. And now that that's gone, he's been, he's told to get up north on a, on a train kind of thing. You think that might Yeah. Happen? Yeah. But why not? Well, why not? How else is everyone getting there? For God's sake. Do you remember when Dennis told me to make the Tarver fight against Dave Allen and we had the emails with Tarver that were a few years ago. Yeah. And, Tarver and Dennis was telling 10,000 quid. <laughs> and obviously that was just the starter, wasn't it, to fight Dave? And Tarver were like, 10,000? I want, this is what he wanted. He wanted his $75,000 fine paying that, that with the IBF for some, to some drug issue. And he could never fight until that had been paid in America. They put the, they put the, the blackballed him, so, so to speak. He wanted that pay paying plus X amount of training expenses and it picking up and flying over and this and that. And then he started to explain about how he would give him hundred thousand dollars for one training camp up front. And when he was in Rocky, they put him up in Beverly Hills hotel for full duration at filming for that Rocky movie and this and that. But, that it's not 2006, is it? It was 2015, 16, I think, something like that, or 2017, maybe end of 2016. Point I want to make is, do they hang on to the past too much? These boxers. You see, Russ, my only engagement with a lot of pro boxers is I consume their product. That's it. I might buy a ticket. I might buy a pay per view. I might watch Sky or BT Sport. Yeah. That's all. When they leave and someone else comes in, I consume their product. What they're going to do with their lives is irrelevant to me. Mm. So if they walk around and they still believe that they're the superstar, no, nah, they're not. Mate, I've been on a train with Chris Eubank before. Like we're going from Brighton to London and I'm sat opposite Chris Eubank and his missus and I'm sat there with my missus. And I'm like, I, I, I can't even get any words out. Chris Eubank, the dad or the kid? The dad. Yeah. What, yeah, he doesn't get normal, norm, on normal, uh, standard ticket. Yeah, Brighton to London, Victoria, standard. Didn't bat an eyelid. 
What, he just carried on as normal? Yeah, I've, I've been on the tube with Spencer Fearon, like we were going to Oxford Circus. Do you know what I mean? Like, some, there comes a point in your life where you've just got to be normal again. Yeah. Well, Spencer Fearon had them all fawning over him when he were unbeaten and he was going to be the next big thing when he were trained by Adam Boove and he had that crouching style, didn't he? Like Groves and Adam Boove and all that. And sorry, David A. And, and that, that ruined him. I feel Spencer would have done better with a different style because it, if you've met him in person, Russ, you'll know he's really tall for a light for a light middle. For a light Spencer middle, Fearon's yeah. really tall. Good job as well, didn't he? Yeah, I would have I would have boxed him a lot longer. I'd have had him use his height to his full advantage. He, he'd have been a nightmare to box. I saw him spar Anthony Small, you know, Smalls. That was at the old Cronk Gym in Camden. Mm. They were having a bit of a laugh. You could see that they were having a laugh. But, I, I, God, I used to have that video. But when you watch Anthony Small throw that, that double and triple hook, mate, if you've ever been hit with that, you'll know how hard that is. Hardest punching small man like I can think of, it, to be honest with you. Should have fought Ryan Rhodes. That would have been a good fight. Iced him. Would have iced him. You reckon? Ryan Rhodes yeah. is a surgeon, mate. A surgeon. Nah. If, if Anthony Small lands on your chin, you sleep. Like, there's no ifs, buts, or maybes about Imagine it. Imagine them Back. about today, Anthony Smalls. Uh, is it small or smalls? Small. Anthony Small and Ryan Rhodes today as, as super welterweights in this era. They'd run riot, wouldn't they? We, 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 it depends on what. Do you want Do you want radicalised Muslim Anthony Small or do you want old, qualified, sparky Anthony Small? Or is he a plumber? I always forget. What I don't want is Anthony Small knocking on my door because I'd just stand over at jewellery. <laughs> <laughs> if you turned up at my house wearing one of them uh, radical outfits, I'd just stand it over, mate. So leave me alone, Anthony. No, I'd, I'd like to see him uh, go, just go on the attack, basically, because I just thought he was an exciting fighter and he always had plenty to say. He was very vocal about Frank Warren, wasn't he? Mm. For me... But the thing about Anthony Small, Russ, this is the thing. He's a really quiet guy. Like in the gym, he's one of those guys who was quiet. And so unless you say something stupid to him, he generally just sit there, get changed and go. Yeah. But if you say something stupid to him, uh, he'd be there for hours ripping into you. So you're like, okay, we're just going to leave him alone now. Yeah, you could imagine him getting very vocal on some political topics, couldn't you? Oh, you can now. Yeah, I can now. I've seen some of them videos that, he, that he's done. Uh... I want to finish off with these last two. Uh, Chris Eubank, Junior, what next for him? Um, will he have improved under Roy Jones? Because he's took his son off social media, he's gone out to America, he's been out there months, and they say he's putting the graft in him. To say he's come from a silver spoon uh, upbringing, I, I, I'm quite excited about what next for him. Are you, uh, Terry? I'm a big Eubank Jr. fan. I've, you've heard me say it loads of times, Russ. He's yeah. one of the few kind of self-made boxing stars because you think about it, right? Hearn looks at most people and goes, I created that guy. That's, what, that's Hearn's thing. That's what he loves talking about. Yeah. I created him. I gave him opportunities. No one did anything for Eubank Jr. apart from Mick Hennessy. Mm-hmm. Like Mick Hennessy put him on. But after that, Eubank just, he became his own brand. So if, if Eubank told you now, I'm fighting... Charlo, you'd watch it, right? You'd 100% watch it. If you said he's fighting Jacobs, you'd 100% watch it because Jacobs is a free agent now, so you could fight him. He could fight Lemieux. You, my junior, could fight anyone, Russ, and you're tuning in. So whoever he fights next, I don't know, but I'm tuning in. I don't even care if he loses. I'll watch his next fight and his next fight. I just think he's the, he's the most compelling boxer we have in this country by some distance. Mm. You, how do you go from brighton college to then just toughing it out in roy jones's gym in pensacola wherever it is tallahassee one of the two in his jeans off his dad in it obviously surely uh well best jeans to get if you ask me yeah well, if you're going to be a boxer like think about this russ right if we were if we were there right and like we were treating this like horse racing Eubank, like 20 generations down the line, when they look at like this elite boxer, he'd have Eubank genes in him. 
Like they like we bred this toughness into him. Yeah. We bred this raw strength into him from from this is the Eubank line of strength. And you might have a little bit of froch in there for for uh, I think stamina, not not for chin, probably for stamina. That's about it. I don't think he ever gets dropped, me, do you? Who? Eubank Jr. is that tough. Nah, yeah. I mean, he just rides it out, man. But if he'd gone on long enough, I think he would have got dropped badly. But peak Eubank? Nah, nah. That was a chin of iron. Yeah. Uh, let's just finish off on this then. Uh, Eddie Earn obviously has been going 10 years now. How many world champions has he had from debut? Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> 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 Russ, I'm not gonna, no, no, I'm not going to answer that question. What, what we're going to do now is we're just going to have a period where we just stick it to Eddie, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just find reasons to stick it to Eddie. Charlie <laughs> Edwards, Joshua, Callum <laughs> Smith, uh, who else? Katie Taylor. Who else is there? Joshua, Callum Smith, Katie Taylor, Charlie Edwards. There's another one, isn't there? I'm trying to think. Can't say Savannah Marshall because she won't be in from the beginning. We can't say Callum Smith because Sowerland's got him that. So, because Sowerland, Sowerland's promoted that. So it's Joshua, Katie Taylor. I don't want to count her because she's a woman. So it's just Joshua and Charlie Edwards, isn't it? Ah, oh, this is cold, man. Like, there are many things you can dig Eddie Hearn out for, but I don't think he's been going 10 years, Russ. When, when was his first show? First show where Richard Towers were on undercard, Kel Brook in Sheffield in Hillsborough. But that's not 2010. Sure, it was 2010 or 2011. You'd have to check on box, right? Somewhere around about that. Carl Frotch signed with him in 2000 and. 11, beginning of 11, and Kel Brook and Barker were there months before, so it had to be 2010, didn't it? Um, uh, I, I, that period is quite foggy, right? Because you got well, when was Hay versus Harrison? That was 2000, and was well, that 2010, November, somewhere around about that, was it? Yeah, so and he wasn't a promoter then. Right. Oh, right. So, so he, he was known as the front man for Matchum then, wasn't he? All right, then. So he's been promoting nine years, but he was fronting yeah. it up for his dad money for the first year. So yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the okay. So in 10 yeah. years in the Eddie Hearn era, he's not had a world champion who's not been from the EIS up here. All his world champions have come from the English Institute of Sport, which is a conveyor belt funded by the lottery. And I have a problem with that. Because where's his world champions from debut that are not up there? Dylan White, he went with him from debut. So where, where's this guy from the streets? These Eddie Ernst keeps talking about boxing's from the streets. We're taking people off the streets. Well, who was he taking? Yeah, he took Rocky Fielding from Prize Fighter, didn't he? To a regular belt. But Rocky Fielding weren't with him from day one. So who's he had from day one that's not been up there from the McCracken conveyor belt? Who? Okay. But no, oh, Russ, but I don't think that's his job. I know that, but I'm just saying we want a level playing field, don't we? We don't want the EIS giving him the Olympians like 2012, 2016, 2020. Well, they're into 2020, but it's next summer. He'll be giving it pick at Tokyo, lads, won't he? Okay, okay, oh, okay. But let's let's hold it there, Russ, and go. 2012, right? Who did he sign from 2012? Joshua Acoli, Campbell, Acoli, 2012. Oh, sorry, sorry, Joshua uh, Campbell. Uh, what Tom Stoker? No, Frank got Tom Stoker to start with, didn't he? Yeah. So now, now, who's the best guy that boxed at the 2012 Olympics? Josh. Josh Taylor. No, Josh Taylor. Josh Taylor. Yeah, but he didn't sign him, did he? That's my point. So we're saying he had the pick, but actually, the reality is, it doesn't. It, it didn't help him. Yeah, 2016, who did he get? He got Fowler, Okoli, Boatsy, 
apart from Okoli, the others you're kind of like they're in the they're in the mix and their weight classes. So that hasn't helped them either. So this EIS thing, and you and I have talked about this um, off the record, Russ. It's a myth. Just like the East End boxing thing is a massive myth. All of this stuff is a myth. The truth is, the right fighter and the right trainer is is more luck than science sometimes. And when you get it right, you could be from Denaby or you could be from Yeovil and you'll get to the top of the world. The EIS is, all it does is it teaches you to be a dedicated athlete. It doesn't teach you to be a great boxer. They don't have the facilities to do so. Are we saying that Joshua's manufactured then? Yeah, he'd admit that himself. Yeah. And what about Luke Campbell? Will he be another one of Eddie's gold medal uh, world champions from debut if he wins uh, wins against Garcia? I'd like Luke Campbell to win a world title because he ticks all your boxes, Russ. He's a guy that he, that did come from the streets. He's a guy that did it all the right way. Won his ABA title, won some European amateur tournaments, went to the Olympics, won a gold medal. If ever you wanted someone to be a world champion, it's Luke Campbell. Yeah, but I'm on about from the streets. I'm on about kids from small all. You know, well, why? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Why? Well, why small hall though? Well, I'm on about Eddie. Eddie signing somebody that went from EIS. You know that kind of thing, like signing some ABA champion that 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 it didn't go to Olympics and stuff like that. I want to see him. Do okay, a- who? Give me the names of the people you wish he had signed. Well. There isn't that many. Is Clinton Woods? He took. He missed that one. Dennis did that with Clinton Woods, didn't he? Took him to a world title from debut. Yeah, but but Eddie Hearn was like twelve, Russ. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying. Well, why didn't Barry Hearn? Barry Hearn's had one world champion who went from up there, and that were her behind. So Barry, I don't even. Know. Are we just beefing with the Hearn family today? <laughs> yeah, I'm just actually rip because it makes me feel better about my life when I just put Eddie in his place. <laughs> and he's got a fucking terrible comb over as well. No, but um, that's why I'll defend Eddie. I'll say, tell me the people Eddie should have signed that he didn't. I don't know. I can't think of names. I could say Chris Congo, but that's a that's a seventy thirty. I'm seventy percent confident Chris is world title level. He could have signed Echo Esterman, same weight class, similar profile. He's definitely British. Could probably fight for a European. He's at that level. But then after that, you're kind of like Lyndon Arthur, maybe. But then you're struggling for names of people he could have signed. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. All right, then. Last question, then. Uh, Len Johnson, uh, Man- uh, Lancashire, out Lancashire, Manchester area. The, there's a petition up by Nigel Travis that's gone viral to get uh, Len a statue which I ain't got a problem with. Uh, Rico believes that uh, these people that are saying that they should have a statue should deal with it themselves uh, instead of going through and get, getting out on social media and calling for it. Look, I'm all for it, but there's people calling for it, like Coogan and Michelle Phelps, who don't even know Len. And you feel that, do you feel that people try to insert themselves into these situations just for likes and and to get more popular themselves and make it about them. Russ, we're in the we're we now like, I think last decade we're talking about we were in this this disruptive economy and technology was going to change the way we did everything. I think we're now in the attention economy, where if we can draw attention to ourselves, we can make money. If we can draw attention to ourselves, we can become spokespeople for brands and so forth. So whenever there's a situation and you can turn it to your advantage in terms of attention, that's what people do now. That's why you get all the nonsense you do. That's why social media is such a terrible place mm-hmm. because it, it's all about sympathy. The easiest, there are two ways you can get attention in life for us. You can be the hero or you can be the victim. Yeah. And a lot of people make the sympathy play. So that's what these guys like Coogan do. They go, okay, let me just show that let me show the public that I'm on the right side of the discussion by just getting involved in stuff I don't know about. Yeah, but you don't even know Len. He won't even have heard of, he won't have even heard of Len's name until people in the Manchester area started going on about this statue. They won't have heard his name, but 
because statues are a bit political now, everybody's sort of jumped on it, haven't they? You think? Yeah. Some people, though, I know, been, were asked to do it and didn't know him and just did it out of goodness of their heart. But there's, a, there's people with ulterior motives, and I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. It's like Bellew, every time something happens in boxing, he does an interview and makes it about him, doesn't he? <laughs> Did you see that one where they were going on about Daniel Dubois, he quit in the ring, and if that had been me, you'd have needed a baseball bat to make me quit, and that kind of carry on. And Is that what Bell you said? Yeah, he sounds like I fell. He turned it okay. in. Like he, like, he for, he, like he forgot the Adonis Stevenson fight where he literally pooed his pants. Yeah, he turned away like John L. Gard, like Paul Sykes against John L. Gardner, didn't he? He turned away. Once he did that, it were over for him, wasn't it, in that corner? Yeah. So that to yeah. me, that's classed as a quit, isn't it? They call that a quit, don't but We live in a strange world, Russ. So I look at the world we live in, and last week, people were saying Dubois should just, I mean, he should have toughed it out, forget health and all that, see it through to the end. You know, you owe it to the fans. And the same people are now tweeting, Anthony, I should just get rid of Tunde right now. Get rid of him. Yeah. Just, and I'm like, <laughs> you, how stupid are you people? Boxing fans are the stupidest group it's of people. I've been think. through all sorts with Anthony Yard that people don't even know Tunde. He's probably, this... I saw Curtis Woodhouse has been is very vocal about getting rid of him, saying he's a clown. Um, I, I'd like to see Chris Medley training, but it won't happen. But, they shouldn't be hammering the trainer because Dan for the yard probably had dark times when he's he did his father die and his granddad. It was, it was a granddad or grandmother, but yeah, he had two relatives die of COVID. He's probably gone to Tundis and, and and opened up about how he feels about that and been upset. So there's a bond there, isn't there? And if he goes with somebody else, Anthony Yard, there might not be that same bond and Russ is deeper than that. Yeah, like, no, I mean, like Tunde's put his hand in his pocket. He flew Anthony Yard, O'Hara Davis, and Junior Saba out to Vegas to the Mayweather gym. They went down there. I think they spent two or three weeks out there sparring everyone. That was Tunde. Every year he'd take them there out of his own pocket. He would take them there. What other trainers are doing that? I know Mickey Elliott does it every so often. He did it with Daryl Williams, yeah? So Curtis Woodhouse, who's a clown, all these other people who are clowns, who are saying that Anthony R should get rid of Tunde and he should go with this trainer or that trainer, those trainers don't put their hands in their pockets. In fact, they put their hands in your pockets, right? I don't mind so, but I don't agree with him on this. I think that... No, no, no. I get bored of people like Curtis Woodhouse. Like, all these guys who who pipe up. You know how boxers, they're, they're the so, same idiots who, who have an opinion on everything. And then as soon as you talk about boxing, they say, you have no right to talk about boxing because you've never done it to the level I have. He's that sort of clown. Where so a not, champion, though, wasn't he? I just, so, in what era, though? Like, you know what I mean, like his CV is not stellar. I respect what Curtis Woodhouse has done, absolutely. But like I said to you before, Russ, once you put the gloves down, you become a civilian. Yeah. And as a civilian, he's just been a bit of a melt, to be honest with you. And and, and he, there's loads of them like that. Get rid of Tundi. Get rid of Tunde. Get rid of Tundo. Get rid of him. Do this. Do that. You have no idea how much money Tunde's invested in fighters. You have no idea the level of emotional support Tunde's given to fighters. You have no idea how many people he's kept off the street and kept disciplined. Get rid of Tunde, why? To replace him with who? With who? Like, it never occurs to people, Russ, that maybe Anthony Yard is massively overachieving right now. It never occurs to people to think that. Well, everyone assumes they can make someone better. It's, it's, it's bullshit. Sorry, I know I shouldn't swear on your YouTube channel. It is bullshit, right? You could give me, I'm trying to think of a, name me a, a, a good fighter. You could give me Errol Spence, Russ. Yeah, he might never be as good with me as he is with Derek. Uh, Derek James. Yeah, he might never be as good with me, mm. or he might be better. It's such a gamble that you don't know the outcome, Russ. It's uh, how I'm trying. To, I was trying to describe it to a friend yesterday. Boxing training is like this, right? Well, boxer and trainer together is like trying to make the number eleven, Russell. Right? 
if I know that I'm a six, yeah. I can only look for a five because if I find another six, I've got 12. It's wrong. If I find a four, it's 10. It's wrong. I have to find a five. And if I'm a boxer and I'm a five, I have to find a six in a trainer for it to make 11. That's how boxing and that's how boxing works. Yeah. So with me, there's certain boxers I can't work with. If you're lazy and you lack drive, I can't work with you. Yeah. If you don't have the intelligence to understand what I'm saying, I can't work with you. But then some people can't work with boxers who are too intelligent because they're not that intelligent themselves. Yeah. Exactly. So people talk without thinking. They always assume that the trainers in the fucking public eye, like you said, Russ, the trainers doing the interviews, they always assume those people have the answers. Go to not even the best Ooh, trainers. He's the best. They're not, they're not even the best trainers. Because like I said to you before, the best trainers in this country are the guys that get the amateurs. Yeah? The, your best trainers in this country are in amateur gyms right now. Because they're, they're the creators. Trainer though, isn't Come on, what? And, and Cole, well, we have to give him credit. They are... So, so, well, so, so Adam's a good trainer, but Russ, do you know why Adam's a really good trainer? Why? Because in the early years of David Hayes' career, he was happy to let Ishmael Salas train him. And he learned from Ishmael Salas and he learned from Jorge Rubio. That's why they used to go out to Miami in the old days. So he could learn from the Cuban coaches that were out there. So he learned from all those Cuban coaches. And so as he became more confident in executing that style, he took on more of the responsibility. But how many British trainers do you know, Russ, would go out there and go, let me go and learn from someone else? Yeah, well, uh, Dennis sent Steffi Bull and Jamie McDonnell out to, to train in Miami to, to pick up knowledge back in the day. That seemed to be the in thing back then, didn't it? Well, because well, he saw it work with Adam. There's no coincidence. Dennis saw it work with Adam. Yeah. Oh, Next, yeah. David A, didn't he, Dennis? Hmm? Dennis had David A, didn't he, when he won Maloney? That's my point. So now you're, see, you're seeing the link now, right? Yeah. Adam goes out to Miami. You see the improvement in David. Dennis is like, oh, well, if you can just get that experience out of Miami, when I get my next trainer, who I trust, let me send him out there with a fighter I trust, and hopefully he'll come back with the same knowledge and skills. But I don't think Steffi's got four brain cells to rub together, if we're being honest. Not for not as regards training. I mean, they all say that Steffi trains Terry Harper, but he didn't. Ray Doyle, Super Ray Doyle, trained Terry Harper. As soon as she got on Sky, Steffi put him to one side and went on as trainer manager. But Ray Doyle trained Terry Harper from debut. Yeah, but when has when has Ray Doyle gone anywhere to learn his craft? No way. Just in Denver, any. Thank you. So, so when, when people talk about these trainers are any good, these trainers don't even want to get better themselves, for God's sake. I mean, it's, it's, the state of British training is embarrassing for that reason alone. Like, there's a handful of people I look at and I say they can get away with not, not, not doing much. And like Glenn Rhodes is one of them because Glenn's been there and he's seen it all. And like, I mean, the knowledge Glenn has, yeah. I mean, you'd, you'd pay to, to spend a week with Glenn just to listen. I feel the same way about Peter Fury now, where you'd pay to sit there and listen to Peter for a week and just get that wisdom. Yeah. And that's what young trainers should be doing now. They should be going to see Peter and go, Pete, can I just spend a week watching what you do? They don't like to be overloaded. Peter Fury don't like to be overloaded with all this spreadsheet stuff and all this technical stuff. They just believe in basic fundamentals. First things Peter told me he believes in is if you're not fit, get gone. That's what how he says to his fighters. If they're not going to be fit, how can you do anything late on in a fight if you're not fit? That's the first thing, fitness. Second, mm -hmm. defence, footwork, jab. Or if they get all the basics right, don't they? Yeah. And too many trainers nowadays, they all want to be pad men and, and mm -hmm. this and that. And they're overloading fighters with that much that I think fighters' heads, they're all, they're the most feel like they're going to explode. So then they have to surround themselves with all these advisors, don't they? And nutrition guys and everybody's walking around in the same tracksuit and all that. Whatever happened to a trainer just turning up somewhere with his fight? I mean, I watched an old video the uh, other day. Robin Reed and uh, Brian Hughes turned up at this show, World Title Defence, and they were just Robin Reed 
and Brian Hughes getting out Robin's M3 BMW, you know, an old school uh, 1996 model M3, which is still got in garage collecting dust. Robin, come see me, I'll sort it for you. This is collecting money as well. They're getting they, those yeah, are going it's up. You know, it's a P res Robins, they give 35 grand for it, I think. And it's one of them, it's like a I forgot the colour color of it, it's like a cassette. Like a Caspian blue, that would be an old XR3 I like blue. He's still got it in his garage, and uh, he doesn't know what he's doing with it. And it's one of them with soft top and an hard top as well. But they pulled up in that and just walked into this press conference or walked into the fight to hotel, sorry, the night before the fight. I think it was after it weighing, and they never had groups of people around. They were just old man Brian Hughes and Robin Reed there in a pair of them big Timberlands. Do you remember when they first come on team, Timberlands? Yeah. They were like yeah. a light brown colour, weren't they? Big pair of them. And that was it. And Robin said, well, that's just how it were in them days. They didn't have groups. Obviously, odd fighter did. Nigel Ben had a bit of an entourage, didn't he? But Robin said, I didn't need all that around me. Do, do you know what I mean? And nowadays, there's nutrition men, there's there's a, a strength for condition men, there's chiropractic men, there's masseur men, and but you know why, Russ? Coaches, go on, what? Because people don't know how to train anymore. So in the old days, right, and I know this is true in America, it's true in Cuba, it's definitely true in Africa, and it's true in Russia. You used to train everything. So you trained your boxing skills, you trained for boxing strength, you trained for mobility and flexibility. So you should never have needed all these masseurs and chiropractors because you were doing all the right things. You might have done a little bit of weightlifting, but not much, just enough to make you strong what you had to do in the ring there was none people have overcomplicated it like there's a guy in Sheffield called Danny Wilson isn't it who trains with I don't know I think he tra trains with Callum Beard now at the moment and he's all talking about all this boxing science stuff and I went through a phase Russ where I was really into all that science stuff and then I realized well actually boxing is a really simple sport man if you're really skillful and really fit you're probably going to win so how about we focus on getting fit and getting skillful? The problem is a lot of trainers don't know how to teach the skills and the techniques and the fundamentals. They don't. And they, they con you by the pad work they put on Instagram and so forth. That's how they con you. It's who's teaching those basics? Who's teaching you where you need to put your feet? Who's teaching you how to read a southpaw? No one's really teaching that anymore. And because of that, boxers are becoming bad decision makers in the ring. That's what's killing British boxing is that the guys we have don't know how to make decisions in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting times ahead, Johnny. This is why we love this sport so much. It's getting gritty, rugged. Sizzle, <laughs> rough, tough, rugged, durable, all action, compelling, sizzling, added spice. <laughs> we love being done. What about this one? It's good to have the blue ribbon division back, Matt. What do you think? <laughs> it's paying dividends. <laughs> you know, Adam Smith is the only man I know that makes boxing sound like an investment with an icer, doesn't it? Those punches will pay dividends later. <laughs> <laughs> or you'll turn, you'll turn it into a Gordon Ramsay curry, won't it? Sizzling. Added spice that, Johnny. But, uh, yeah, so that'll do for today then, Teddy. But thanks for coming on. No worries, mate. Well, I just want to say to all you hardcores watching that these videos are now going out every day at 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. And that's how we're going to do it from now on. That's the porky slot. None of this chuck throwing them out in the morning and the evening. It's 6 p.m. every night. Hopefully seven nights, if we can keep the content good. Yeah, do, do it 6.15. Why 6.15? Because most people will program their videos to land at 6 o'clock, Russ, so you want to hit the notifications after the traffic. <laughs> you want to, to over up all them stuck, in, stuck on Kennington Road in London, like me, getting, getting an admission <laughs> charge, a congestion charge, and a Dartford Tunnel charge. Hey, you love it, really. I love Sadiq Khan, don't I? He's so popular. They've given him another year, aren't they, because of the virus. You're a nine-year mayor now, aren't you? 
Well, listen, you, you know I me. Mean? He's a hardcore boxing fan himself, so you got to give him his due. Well, because he goes to Joshua's for his Sunday dinner. No, nah, no, nah, because his brother Sid Khan trained Joe Joyce. Oh, all right then. Well, yeah. So his brother Sid Khan runs Earlsfield Boxing Club, and so Sadiq used to come to the shows. You'd see him in the crowd. So he's always, and he used to train there as well. Listen, don't mess around with Sadiq Khan, mate. You might get a left hook. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. That's you... a serious. Listen, that's a serious family. Like, like the wider Khan family. That's a serious family. Like, who's checking in my fucking boats? Well, okay. Come, 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 come and have a little butchers. You, you'll know. <laughs> Listen, mate. I bet that gym had plenty of funding. Uh, well, not back then. So, you, but remember, that's the gym that gave you three ABA champions in one year: Joe Joyce, uh, Louis Adolphe, Kurt Garvey. I think in one year. Kurt Garvey, I remember him. Like heavyweight. Yeah. I tried. Do you remember when I had that list and I was saying to Dennis we need to do a light heavyweight tournament and there were all them kids, Jake, yeah. Luke Garvey, and all those kids. Uh, that were all undefeated, you know, like novice types. Yeah. And uh, he were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But f- uh, two weeks later, I'm like, yeah, Dennis, what about this? Are you going to speak to free sports? And he were like, Ugh, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it on that. I don't think I'm going to enjoy it. And I was like, what? It's a great idea. Well, we spoke about it, didn't we? A few years ago, that, wasn't it? Would have been, that would have been good. And like... I had a light heavyweight tournament. We ate light heavyweights from UK. And they were all under 10 and 0. I thought that would have been brilliant at the time, honestly. But we can only try, can't we, moving forward? So, yeah. Right. All right, then, Teddy. Well, listen, I know you've got to get to Jim, and I've got to get into office now and get my stuff ready for tomorrow. I'm going to uh, I'm going to Essex tomorrow to see Mickey Theo. Um, oh, you're going to fight him? No, I'm just going to go see him and have a chat. I'm taking a film crew down with me. All right, Russ. What is yeah? Gonna bring you down here. Yeah. This is where this is where Pat Tate used to knock about Russ and back that. You know, still, Russ. Back, back, oh. still. Mate, That's tell it. you what, son. Epping Forest Country Club all used to go off round here, son. All used to go off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I'm going down to the land of Bentleys. I'm probably going to call and see Mark Tidge for a couple as well while I'm down there, but I'm looking forward to it, getting out of uh, South Yorkshire. For a ah, Mark Tibbs. That was a good video you did with Mark, man. I, oh, I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, and I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. about Big Frank Bruno at middle of, uh, middle of Gantz Hill, Essex, getting out yeah, of Yeah, well, well, well Frank, Frank was a proper gentleman, Russ. What he's done is he stopped the car in the middle of the road. He's come out. I've gone out to meet him halfway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you like that video? Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. Mark, 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 Mark's got some stories, man. He's a good guy. I like. Mark. Oh God, there's some I can't tell, but he, he, he's a, he's a, he's a good he's a good storyteller, Mark, and all true. Uh, salt of the earth, one of your own, mate. One of your own. <laughs> but yeah, I like they, they, they don't have to talk bollocks in Essex. <laughs> He's <laughs> East Camden Town. No, he's he's East Ham, isn't he, Mark? He's yeah. He's Essex now. He lives in Essex now, Upminster, but he's a nice enough kid. Nah, I've like, got a lot of time. Yeah, I know you've got a lot of time for anybody in boxing, you Terry. We know. No, nah, no, no, not just anyone. Russ. It's an exclusive club. Yeah, we, we we're funny about who we let into our circle, aren't we, Terry? One hundred percent. So, well, listen, you have a good, a great day. Um, All right, mate. Speak to you soon. And you we'll take, care. take care, pal. Moving on, Terry. Bye. No worries, mate. Bye. Bye. Well, that were Terry uh, from London. Big boxing fan, amateur trainer, merchant banker, jack of all trades, master of one. And that's just his podcast. <laughs> no, nah, only breaking balls here. Thanks for listening. It's been a great one. We've done over an hour and a half, so it's a bit of a treat for you. We've covered most topics. We've given our opinion on things that uh, we like to give an opinion on. We like to be quite vocal. Uh, not everybody will. Not everybody will like our opinion on uh, boxing, but I don't really care to be honest. I'm past caring with it now. 
like and subscribe and leave a comment and share it amongst your pals on your WhatsApps if you liked it. If you don't like it, don't share it. If you disliked the video, don't leave a comment. Do you know if, you, if you're not happy with it, but majority of people tend to like them. We've got a bit of a captive court audience at the moment, I suppose. So analytics tell me. So as long as you keep leaving comments and some of this video goes out, it gets 30, 40 comments in the first hour. So we must be doing something right, but we're only a little small, tiny channel. But channels going places and like I said, keep watching. We've got some good stuff coming out in next week or so, some stuff in production. And we're working with some other tech guys now. So it's all good stuff. All right. So, all right. So that should be an interesting drive down there tomorrow. So this will be out tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, I'm going to get into work because it's early. This will be out tonight at 6 p.m. And tomorrow I'll be down there. Back here still. Is it Essex? Nicky will be trying to stick pie and mash into me, whatever they eat down there. Is it pie and mash they eat? Jelly deals? Pie and liquor or something? All good stuff. Wherever it is, I'll probably just spew it up, so I'll just stick to my shakes because I'm not on a solid yet. <laughs> so peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep supporting boxing. Don't forget to give a big up to uh, the people that have helped channel at the moment. There's eight companies that have helped us so far and they'll usually pop up at beginning and end all right so thank you very much from the bottom of my heart